and she's going to provide an overview of food allergy and allergen avoidance strategies at home, restaurants, and other social settings. So please give a warm welcome to our first speaker. Okay, thank you all for no afternoon naps, no mid-after-lunch mid snaps, snafus here. Okay, we're going to get started because we're getting a little late. I put more slides in than I probably have time for. So I have packed a whole bunch of information into this, and you will soon be enough, know enough to be dangerous out there to educate your fellow community members. Okay, let's see if I can get this. Oh, and I will stay and during the whole break if someone has questions, if we don't have a lot of question and answer time. So feel free to ask away. Let's see. Oh, Lisa, do I push? Okay. Oh, I see what I'm doing. Wrong button. Sorry. Okay, so today we are going to define what a food allergy is. Do I need to move that screen? Sorry. So today we are going to define what a food allergy is, and we are going to discuss the difference between a food allergy and an intolerance or an adverse food reaction. And we're going to talk about a few strategies to help safely protect the food allergic consumer. So a food allergy has only recently been officially defined. Um, the NIH and a lot of medical bodies came up with the definition as defined as an adverse health effect arising from a specific immune response that occurs reproducibly on exposure to a given food. So the key point in this is it is involving the immune system all the time. Every time that food is consumed, the immune system kicks in. And it occurs reproducibly, so every time a food allergic person eats the food that they are allergic to, a symptom will happen. As opposed to a food intolerance, obviously we know foods have many impacts in the body. Um, a food intolerance is just an untoward response to a food substance not involving the immune system. So lots of different ways that food can have an impact on the body, but not involving the immune system. So here, if I had a little pointer, um, the immune system we are dealing with are IgE-mediated. Um, we have different classes of antibodies in our immune system, but bee sting allergies, food allergies, involve IgE-mediated allergies. So in the first column are IgE-mediated uh, syndromes. We have systemic anaphylaxis, oral allergy syndrome, GI allergy, some types of asthma, um, the middle column is what's known as kind of a mixed IgE. There, it sometimes involves the, immune, the IgE immune system. It's kind of a mixture of both the immune system and not the immune system. And you may run into people that have eosinophilic esophagitis. It's kind of an emerging new disease. They've probably been researching it for the past dozen years or so. Um, it involves typically 80% of those with EE have an IgE-mediated allergy, as well as an intolerance to a lot of other foods. Um, and then some non-IgE-mediated, you may see to food protein-induced enterocolitis, or FPIs. That generally involves newborn infants, um, really about from about six to eight months, maybe when they're introduced into a formula fed. They get um, kind of like shock syndrome, it's very scary, very serious, but very rare also. So what is not a food allergy? Um, a lactose intolerance or another kind of intolerance to a food, a sensitivity to a food, celiac disease, irritable bowel, food aversions. If you do not like a food, you are not allergic to it. <laughs> kind of the big one with food allergies is prevalence is pretty high among infants and young children, and food allergies can be quite severe. Um, it takes very little of the offending food to bring on symptoms and cause bad things to happen. 
Um, management of a food intolerance. If you're lactose intolerant, generally you can consume some dairy products without that much ill effect. Um, but you don't have to completely avoid and take it completely out of your out of your diet. Whereas food allergies, you have to recognize what's in your food, you have to read food labels, and you have to practice diligent avoidance. Um, we're going to skip this one because it's too long. <laughs> Just out of time. Um, the epidemiology of food, if you, if you poll the general U.S. population, 30% of them will say they have a food allergy or know someone that has a food allergy. In reality, a very small percentage of people have food allergies. Um, about 2 to 3% of adults and three or 6 to 8% in children. Um, oral allergy syndrome we'll talk about, and that affects about 20% of the population. The prevalence of food allergy, um, around 9 million adults and 6 million children have an IgE-mediated food allergy. The prevalence of food allergies has indeed become greater. Um, the NIH has documented about a, oh, what is that, tripling of peanut allergy over about a decade. Um, the good news is that about 85% of kids will outgrow their food allergies to milk, egg, wheat, and soy. And even ch children that are affected with peanuts and tree nuts can outgrow about 15 to 20%. Um, this is the estimated US prevalence of food allergies kind of broken down per food. Um, you'll kind of see children are more affected with cow's milk, egg, wheat and soy and peanut. And then adults, generally you'll see more seafood, fish and peanut and tree nut allergies. So the current situation, we know millions of people are impacted on a worldwide basis. Symptoms can be severe or life-threatening. And the scary part is you don't know how severe your reaction may be. There are eight foods here in the US that are mandated by the FDA that are responsible for 90% of all food allergic reactions. Although there have been over 175 other foods that have been documented to cause an allergy. Um, this is just our pie, pie chart to kind of give you an idea. Um, the 160, there's probably over 200 foods now. The 160 number came from one of the professors here at the university. They went through all the data and documented all the foods that have been mentioned in the medical literature. So that's where we're at. And that was about 20 years ago. So I'm sure the number is higher than, than it is. Um, obviously, there are hundreds of other food allergies. And they're regulated in different parts of the country or different parts of the world. And kind of depending on the foods that are in your region, you'll see a higher prevalence of allergy in that region. So for example, the Mediterranean has a very high rate of fish allergy because fish is a common food in their population. Um, same with buckwheat in Asia. We don't generally eat a lot of buckwheat here in the US, but in Asia, you'll see much more buckwheat. So what causes a food allergy? Generally, food allergies are caused by the protein in a food. Um, the scary thing with food allergies is that that protein cannot be destroyed with cooking, heating, frying, baking, sauteing, none of, nothing will touch that food allergen and change its conformation to make it less harmful. Also, it is heat stable. It's also acid stable. So when it gets into the digestive system, it's unaffected by the gastric secretions. Um, as I mentioned before, milk, egg, peanut, and soy and wheat are the most prevalent in children. And then adults, you'll see the fish, shellfish, tree nuts, and peanut. So we're going to talk very briefly about cross-reactivity among foods. Um, you can have cross-reactivity either within the food group, such as crustaceans. Crustaceans all belong to the same population species. Their protein manifestation is all pretty similar. So the protein that causes shrimp allergy, that protein in shrimp is very common and almost looks identical to that in lobster. Um, but on the converse, you can have food allergies to unrelated substances. So you can have what's called pollen food syndrome or oral allergy syndrome. Some people in this room might have it. 
Um, ragweed is the big allergen here in the Midwest if you're ragweed allergic. Um, sometimes people that have ragweed allergy also get itchy, watery, or can have watery nose and eyes when they eat melons and cucumbers because the proteins in those foods are very similar in appearance to that of ragweed. So it cross reacts. Um, we also sometimes see latex fruit syndrome. If someone has a latex allergy, the proteins in bananas, kiwis, chestnuts, and avocados can also be recognized. And so they will cross react and cause symptoms. This is just kind of a diagram. Cross reactivity is not all the way across the board. So oftentimes if you're diagnosed with say a shrimp allergy, your physician is going to tell you to avoid all other crustacean shellfish. So no lobster, krill, those kind of foods. But you can see the cross reactivity is different between food groups. So if someone has a peanut allergy, the physician will probably follow up and check, especially in a young child, if lentils, peas, and beans are going to affect that child as well. But you can see there's only a 5% chance of reactivity. So it's not as great. Whereas if you look at the shellfish, there's 75% chance that you're going to react to another kind of shellfish. Um, for one, I didn't put this on the slide, but if someone has a cow's milk allergy, goat's milk is 97% likely to be cross-reactive. So we never recommend cow's milk allergic kids to go on goat's milk. We just don't. That's why they do soy or rice instead. So how is a food allergy diagnosed? Um, hopefully they go to see their primary care physician or a board certified allergist. That allergist will do a complete physical and take their detailed history. Um, looking at symptoms, how soon the symptoms occur after eating that particular food, um, if there were some hidden ingredients in the food, what's going on. And then they will progress to doing a skin prick test. And that is just taking a small sample of fresh food extract usually. And they put it either on the child's back or on the forearm and see if your skin has some reactivity to that food. Now, 50% of you in this room, if I did a skin test on you to peanut, probably about 50% of you would have a positive skin test. But probably 50% of you eat peanuts every day and have no problems. So the skin prick test is not completely indicative. It just represents that you have IgE antibodies in your skin reacting to the food. So a skin prick test alone does not diagnose a food allergy. So then they go on to a blood test and they do a cap via immunorast. Um, they take a sample of blood. They check for IgE antibodies to egg or to peanut or milk, whatever food they think. So they don't diagnose 60 foods on a sheet. I've seen those, and those are testing IgG antibodies. Those are not testing IgE antibodies. Um, so they'll just test the three or four different foods that they've kind of eliminated to think that that might be causing the allergy. And then kind of the gold standard is doing an oral food challenge, and that is just taking a very small amount of food and giving it to that person mixed into something else. So they might put peanut flour in pudding or soy flour in jello or something. So it's kind of hidden. They can do double blind or open challenges. Usually they're open. So the patient and the physician knows exactly what's going on. This is just a picture of a skin test on the forearm. Um, not too big a deal. Um, they'll do a control, which is down here. Um, that's a histamine. They'll just inject histamine. You'll automatically get like a mosquito reaction. And then they measure how big that that you see the circles there, they measure that, and that helps predict how possibly allergic if you are allergic. So my son has egg allergy. They did a skin prick test. His measured at 11, which is pretty high. So then they went on and did a blood test, and his came back at 75, 
And so he was 83% likely to have a food allergic reaction to egg. That was kind of how we deduced that he was allergic to egg. So symptoms can occur generally within minutes to a couple hours, always involving the immune system. It can involve hives, swelling, itchiness, kind of what you generally think of an allergy being. Um, it can affect the GI system. You get vomiting, diarrhea. Um, in Sam's case, he would eat egg. He would get some welts around his neck and his chest. And then about four hours later, he would start throwing up. And then about eight hours later, he'd have diarrhea for two days. That was what we always thought was the flu. It took us three or four times to finally think, you know, no one else is getting the flu and he's not running a fever. Something else is going on. Um, it can also involve the respiratory system. And this is kind of tricky because a lot of people have asthma also on top of their food allergies. So if they are having a food allergic reaction, oftentimes they some, or sometimes think they're having an asthma attack. So they'll go for their asthma inhaler rather than their EpiPen. And there have been deaths reported thinking because they thought they were having an asthma attack and they were really having a food allergic reaction. Um, probably the scariest and most is cardiovascular system. You have hypotension and cardiac arrest, and then <clears throat> it progresses into anaphylaxis which can involve one system or all the systems. Not always do you have hives and skin reaction when you're having a food allergic reaction. Um, those with asthma and multiple food allergies are at highest risk for a death. And the only treatment thus far is an epinephrine auto injector. They come either as EpiPens or AbiQs. Um, AbiQ, will actually talk to you. It's a little disc and it counts to 10 after you stick the needle in and it kind of tells you, it walks you through it. Um, and if someone's having anaphylaxis and they get their EpiPen, you should still call 911 and get emergency treatment because the chance of having a biphasic reaction is pretty, you know, you could have one. And that's when you have immediate symptoms, you give the Epi, EpiPen, the symptoms kind of die down and then about an hour later, those symptoms come run, roaring back. And so you have to have a backup. And that is another reason that um, EpiPens come in two packs, so you can treat later. Um, let's see. Anaphylax, oh, I wanted you to be aware that peanut and tree nut allergy is kind of the top of the line when it comes to fatal anaphylaxis. Um, having ana Having asthma also is an indicator of having a death from anaphylaxis. Um, if you're an adolescent or a young adult, you are at the highest risk of having a, fat a fatality, and that is attributed more to behavioral aspects than it is physiological, because when a teenager is not being watched by their parents as much, they're going out with their friends, they're going to the movies, they're going to restaurants, um, college, alcohol might be involved, different things. So that puts them at higher risk. Most anaphylactic events occur away from the home. Schools and restaurants are the number one places where food allergic reactions happen. So are food allergies ri are rising? Yes, they are. Um, there is also an increase in awareness and diagnosis and how those go hand in hand. We're not completely sure. There has been an increase in all allergies and autoimmune disor disorders. And as I stated earlier, the rate of peanut allergy has gone up here in the U.S. and also in Europe. So they've looked at different parts of the world to see if that is kind of the true statement. Um, children with food allergy have a higher risk for developing other atopic disorders, such as going on to develop asthma or dermatitis, those kind of things. So what causes food allergies? The golden question. Um, kind of the biggest one right now is the hygiene hypothesis, and that we know urban areas have a higher rate of allergy and asthma than do rural areas. If you grew up on a farm, you have a lower rate of allergies in general. Um, we have a lot of immunizations and things, and so the thought is that we are not challenging our immune system. 
enough and our environment is too clean in our societies. Um, there have been some food system changes. China has virtually no peanut allergy, but they boil their peanuts in China and we roast our peanuts in the US. So is there some connection there? Um, environmental, we know that there is also some genetic comp components. Um, there is some thought of timing of introduction of solids in our infants. Um, prior to 2008, we recommended you avoid peanuts till you're three, eggs till you're one, fish and shellfish till you're three. The guidelines now say there is no, no recommendation to do that unless you have a child that is at high risk. Um, they are doing some research and we're just waiting for the results to come out. They're supposed to be out this fall. Um, in Europe, the rate of peanut allergy is about the same as it is here in, US, in the US. But in Israel, peanut allergy is virtually non-existent. So they took a population of Jewish people in the UK and the Jewish people in Israel and looked at the differences. In Israel, they give their babies bomba crackers and they're like the teething cookies like we have here in the US, but they're made out of peanuts. So is that driving the peanut allergy march to be less so in Israel than it is in the UK? There is also some thought that vitamin D deficiency is causing our immune system to pick on something else like a harmless protein in food. But really we have, we don't know. There is not any one answer is why food allergies are rising and why they exist. So day-to-day -day management when you have a food allergy, you have to totally avoid that food allergen as of right now. We have to make wise food choices. So if someone has a peanut allergy, we don't recommend they go into the China buffet because peanuts are there. It makes sense, but lots of people challenge those thoughts. If you have a seafood allergy, you probably don't want to go to Red Lobster and order the chicken. Vigilant label reading, um, teaching how to read a food label. Uh, we recommend that um, patients or their families read the food label in the grocery store and again before they cook the product at home, just to double check. Um, and we also have to be mindful that allergens can be in cosmetics and pet foods, lotions, medications. They're in a lot of different places other than just food. And then we have to um, practice safe prep, food prep, and cleanup. So very briefly, we're going to talk some laws. Um, Belka was introduced in 2004, and we'll go over that. Um, if you have a kiddo in public schools and they have a food allergy, they're covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act. It says that you have to provide a safe environment for the school-aged child. Um, there's some other laws here. The school access to emergency epinephrine bill was passed yesterday. President Obama signed it. It's law. Um, it also, he also revealed that his oldest daughter has peanut allergy. So kind of interesting. It kind of hit home for him, I suppose. Um, there are some state laws and regulations. These are mostly schools, how they, their state guidelines. Um, Massachusetts was kind of the first, and theirs is kind of the the model guideline, and they're all available on the web. Okay, we ready? Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about the labeling law. It was passed in 2004. Um, it covers manufactured food products, and it, has, it states that the presence of a major food allergen must be declared in the ingredient label. Um, it can be done one of two ways. It, Food manufacturers can choose to have the ingredient statement with all their ingredients and then put contains milk, egg, wheat. Or they can put it within the ingredient statement parenthetically. So they can have, I don't know, soy oil, peanuts, milk, um, ovalbumin, parenthesis, egg. Prior to 2004, you had to know exactly what ovalbumin was or lactoglobulin because food companies could put the scientific name for a food allergy on the label and that caused a lot of confusion because how many general people know that ovalbumin oval albumin is egg or you know soba noodles are buckwheat I mean you just don't know if you don't have a food science background 
Um, manufacturers also have to specific, specifically name the tree nut, so they have to put pecan, almond, walnut in their statement, and they also have to declare what species of fish or crustacean shellfish. Um, they also have to declare if any of their flavorings or natural flavorings, additives, colorings, anything comes from one of the big eight food allergens. And this is, the big eight was in the pie graph, the egg, milk, peanut, shellfish, soy, blah, blah, blah. So if someone has a sesame seed allergy or sunflower seed allergy or a beef allergy, they have to read the food label. It's not going to have a contained statement. It's going to be in the ingredient statement, but it's not going to be bolded and brought out to highlight. Um, Falca does not apply to pharmaceutical drugs, cosmetics, retail, restaurants, catering, any of those kind of food service establishments. It does not apply to USDA, so eggs, milk, poultry, um, raw fruits and vegetables, or alcohol. Um, highly refined oils are exempt from Falca, which means if the oil is highly refined and comes from a major allergen such as peanut oil, it's highly refined, bleached, deodorized, it's been processed extensively, it is safe for peanut allergic consumers. The same goes with soy, or soy oil. However, if you go into Whole Foods and you find a cold pressed almond oil, the cold press is not enough to pull the protein away. So there's still protein in that oil, and it's not safe for someone allergic to almonds. Um, we're going to go over precautionary labeling. Um, so I'm sure all of you have seen a food label. It says, made in a facility that processes tree nuts, milk, eggs. So what does that mean? Is that part of Falca? No. Precautionary labeling is completely voluntary on the food industry's part and completely unregulated. So FDA has no part in precautionary labeling. Um, there is hundreds of different kinds of precautionary statements. There's no set rule of what they can say on their package. Um, the way it's worded doesn't correlate with the degree of risk. So for me, may contain egg sounds a little more dangerous than manufactured in a facility that processes egg. But really, that's not true. It, does, it doesn't matter. So we have to tell people you have to avoid the, the products that have precautionary labels. So here is just an example of the contained statement and then also of a precautionary statement. And the reason companies do precautionary labeling, if you can imagine like M&Ms, M&Ms, they probably have at least 10 different varieties of M&Ms on the market. Well, they don't have 10 different pieces of equipment making each single kind of M&M. They're all made on the same line. So your almond M&M will be made with your peanut butter M&M, which will be made with your pretzel and your plain. And your, you know, so they, there is a degree of risk there. And M&M is telling the consumer, yes, this could be a danger. Now, you'll get, there are people out there that we know consumers don't follow the rules of avoiding the precautionary statements. And so they should, but they don't. And we know they don't. Um, I want to talk briefly about threshold. We might skip over most of it because it's pretty in-depth. But it's kind of what we are doing at FARP. It's kind of where the, our passion lies right now because we think we know that people have a threshold to food allergen. It's not zero. Um, we know a threshold specifically presents negligible risk if it's below that threshold, it is different than zero. We know people can tolerate certain amounts of their allergen, and we are trying to get that data and trying to specifically know. There's going to be a different threshold for peanut versus egg versus milk. It's not going to be the same number. So it's going to have to be case by case and food by food. Um, we, have, we have data right now on peanut, egg, hazelnuts, and milk, and we are working on trying to get all the major allergens. Um, we are looking at, this is based on toxicological studies, so we are looking at eliciting doses. What we did was we gleamed all the data on peanut allergic consumers because um, big clinics will see 1,500 patients a year with peanut allergy, and they challenge those patients with very low doses. 
So we looked at all the doses they were given and we created this curve, a dose, dose respondent curve. So we know for peanut, 1.5 milligrams is the eliciting dose. So the very, very sensitive patient will react at 1.5 milligram. But we also have them up to like 60 milligrams to one gram of peanut. So it, it goes from 1.5 milligrams clear to grams. So there's a big, big curve there. And so what we're saying for the food industry and for FDA is we know that there's a threshold. So for toxicological studies, they did this for infant formulas to be defined as hypoallergenic. They take their eliciting dose and then they put in a fudge factor. So for us, we know 1.5 milligrams is the eliciting dose. So then you, pr you plug in this fudge factor and it, so the threshold will be much lower than 1.5 for regulation. So we're talking to FDA, like maybe we could put it at 0.5 milligrams and let the food industry have 0.4 milligrams of peanut contamination in their product and that will be safe for at least 90% of all peanut allergic consumers because we know that that eliciting dose is 1.5. Make sense? <laughs> it's kind of a hard concept to wrap your head around. Okay. Um, so I wanted to bring your attention to those jars up front. Um, just so, just to let you know, there is a very small amount. So the one on my right is one part per million contamination. One part per million is probably not enough to cause any kind of adverse reaction at all. In the pe like, say if that's peanut. Um, the middle one is 10 parts per million. You might get the very utmost sensitive person have a reaction at 10 parts per million, but really the likelihood is very low. But that one on the left is 100 parts per million, and that is enough to make someone very, very ill. So you can see the very small amount of contamination in a food that could potentially cause harmful effects for someone with a food allergy. It's virtually, you, I mean, if that's in your, a mixed food and there's different colors and stuff, you can't pick that out of a food. So just to kind of give you a visual of what that looks like. I'm going to treat her. So for our thresholds, we, need, we know we have to be very careful when we are walking a very delicate line and trying to get food allergic consumers on board when they have been told to completely avoid their allergen. In Europe, they're doing thresholds. A lot of Europeans with a food allergy know what their threshold is. Um, the U.S. has been pretty hesitant to even go there, so we're kind of working with that. Um, Australia also is doing some stuff on thresholds. <coughs> And obviously, we have to collaborate with the food industry and the FDA, and then we also have to get a strict criteria on what precautionary labeling should be. Um, so this will be many, many years down the road, but we're working. We're getting close. Oh, I am going the wrong direction. Sorry. So navigating a food allergen world. How many times do you eat in a day? Think about that. At least probably five. And so if you are fruit allergic, that is five opportunities for you to become ill or have an adverse reaction. And it's not just at home. It's in your car, at the gas station, at the movie theater, at the football game, at the band concert. There's lots of different places that food is at. So lots of quality of life goes into allergy diets and avoidance. Um, those with multiple food allergies, we know they're at a high risk for an impaired nutrition and impaired growth. That happens. We know it. Um, there's also a big emotional component to eating. And when someone is food allergic, there is a lot of emotion into that because if you have a daycare provider, you have to make sure that daycare provider is going to follow the rules. If you have grandma and grandpa, grandma sometimes doesn't understand that she, little Bill can't have cake at his birthday party because it will make him sick or can't have ice cream on his cake because it will make him sick. So there's a lot of counseling that has to go on with families because they, it's not just them taking care of their child. It is school. It is daycare. It is the neighbor's house. It is friends across the street, it's cousins on the camping trip. I mean, it goes on and on and on. 
And there's also a lot of indicators now that there's been quite a bit of bullying going on in the schools. Um, kind of the most was teasing about food allergy or waving the allergic food into that child's face or making threats. And there's also been bullying to the teacher. If the teacher has a food allergy, there's been some inc incidences of putting peanut butter on her desk or on her chair so she would get it and make her sick. So kind of crazy, but it happens. Um, they just released this year the economic impact of food allergy. It is averaged at about $4,100 per child in a food allergic family. And what they did was they looked at direct medical costs, um, ER visits, clinician visits, all of those costs. And then they also looked at um, the cost to the family. Lots of families will keep their child home and homeschool them. Or they, mom will quit her job and take care of the child. Or she will, if she had a job that required a lot of travel, she will take a different position so she doesn't have to travel. So they looked at kind of those indirect costs also. Um, when we're trying to, I tried to keep this very broad in general because it applies both in the home and if you're in the schools educating or in other situations. So there's kind of four components of allergen control. Number one is awareness. So you're not just teaching yourself and your family, you're also teaching the school system, if they are school agers or the daycare center or wherever that child might be. So you have to educate and communicate with people outside your family unit. unit. And then there's also prevention. So within the school system, you have to look at your kitchen design. And you have to identify parts like critical control points, basically, of where that food allergen might be and where it could potentially get into food and how the food allergic child is handled within the school. And without singling out the child and without making them feel outcast, you have to kind of integrate how your design is laid out. You have to have emergency readiness in your home. Wherever that child is, you have to make sure they have their medication. You have to communicate with whoever that child is with. And you have to educate your child because eventually they are going to be on their own and they have to learn how to live with their allergy. Um, then you have to monitor continuous improvement. Look at different things. If, if a reaction happens, what went wrong, what went right. Um, we have to talk about cross-contact. Cross-contact occurs when a safe food comes in contact with an allergen, causing that safe food to contain small amounts of the allergenic ingredient. So aller or cross-contact can occur anywhere. It can happen at, in a large scale in food manufacturing plants. It can happen at grocery stores. Um, we don't recommend the milk allergic child go have the deli ham sliced at hy V because they slice their cheese on the same slicer. Um, and then also in food service restaurants. I worked at Applebee's while I was in college. If you were almond allergic, you were in big trouble because there were almonds flying all over that kitchen making salads and stuff. And the oriental chicken salad was the most popular thing in the whole restaurant. And the almonds just flew. I mean, so almonds are everywhere. Um, if they don't have dedicated equipment, you have to talk to the restaurant manager. Don't, don't talk to the server that's making two thirteen an hour. You bump that up to the manager and then maybe to the chef as well. Um, you also have to think about, like in the schools, tabletops, sponges, dish rags, that kind of thing. After you've cleaned up, did you do a good job and is your dish rag now contaminated? So proper cleaning can prevent cross contact. Um, they've actually done scientific research studies. They went into the school, they smeared peanut butter on the lunchroom tables, they did different ways of cleaning. They did plain water, they did soap and water, they did hand sanitizer, they did Lysol wipes. They did all those things to see what worked best. And what they found out was soap and water was the best option and commercial cleaners. And actually it was the process of actually scrubbing the surface that took off the protein and the residue. What didn't work was just plain old hand sanitizer. It, it took the bacteria right off, but it did not take the allergens off. So we are going to change 
direction just a little bit and talk about celiac disease because avoidance diets go into celiac disease as well. Um, it is a genetically linked autoimmune disorder where gluten evokes an immune mediated response. Generally, celiac disease is IgA mediated, not IgE, like a food allergy. Um, lots of different symptoms go into celiac disease, but you'll often see nutrient deficiency, malabsorption, um, infertility, lots of different migraine headaches, like there, it runs the gamut. Um, it is brought on by gluten proteins that naturally occur in wheat, rye, and barley, and the only treatment is a gluten-free diet. So this is just a microscopic slide of a healthy microvilli. It helps sweep the nutrients in. It's nice and healthy and pink. And then this is an inflamed microvilli with celiac disease. You can see there's not spacing for the nutrients to filter in. So that's part of the reason you get malabsorption. Um, celiac disease is thought to affect about 1% of the population. It takes an average of a, it's probably improved now, but it, usually about a 10 year between by the time you're having symptoms and you're finally diagnosed because the symptoms are so varied that it's hard to pinpoint one thing. Um, it's diagnosed with blood tests and then sometimes biopsy. Biopsy is starting to become obsolete now unless they want something less invasive and the blood tests have improved so much that they're relying more and more on those. Um, these are just a few of the ingredients in a gluten-free diet that is harmful or unsafe. So you can't just tell someone that they need to avoid gluten and wheat, rye, and barley. These all have wheat, rye, or barley in them, so you have to make sure that they know that some of those things, what they are. So like if panko is a breadcrumb, but if you just say panko. And so you can see how confusing it can be if you went into a restaurant and it was described as panko, if you didn't know what panko was, or if you didn't know orzo was a pasta, you, as a consumer, you need to be educated as to what you're ordering in the restaurant. And so that is another reason we recommend when people go out or if they're newly diagnosed, they stick to very simple, plain foods. So a grilled chicken breast and a baked potato and steamed broccoli. They don't try to get the fancy sauces and the gravies and the different crusts and things that are on foods. <clears throat> Here are some other sources where gluten might hide. Um, lunch meats, licorice, medications. Um, if you have kids in school playing with Play-Doh, that contains wheat. So you have to either make your own Play-Doh or find an alternative. Um, these are just a few of the gluten-free substitute flours that people can use that are safe for celiac disease. Um, oftentimes they have to combine three or four of the different kinds of flours in order to make a texture similar to what a nice wheat flour will do in a product. Um, very briefly, we're going to talk about non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Um, this is estimated to have a bigger impact than just celiac disease. But these people are unable to tolerate gluten. They have symptoms. They experience all the things that celiac disease patients have, except they don't have the intestinal damage and the antibodies are not detected. And they, the medical experts that are have all said that this exists. It is there. But there is no biological marker right now. There is no test, no screen that can determine if you have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So that makes it a little hard because with the popularity of gluten-free diets right now, everybody has non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Um, gluten-free labeling, we'll talk about, it was just passed in August of this year. Um, it was part of the FALCA ruling. It's only taken them 10, 10 years, practically, to finally figure out what gluten-free meant. Um, it defines what the characteristics of food has to have to bear the label of gluten-free. Um, that gluten limit of detection is 20 parts per million. Um, they have identified that probably less than 20 parts per million is safe for those with celiac disease. 
they've done some feeding studies and stuff and they haven't seen any ill effects of that level. Um, it's not a huge deal right now to U.S. manufacturers because Canada and the EU have had 20 parts per million for a number of years. So most of the U.S. companies that import and export to other parts of the country and to the world, they've been doing the 20 parts per million already. Um, it helps people with celiac disease give them a clear standard that yes, this is at 20 parts per million or less. Um, before we did some studies and we pulled um, foods off the shelves and did, and did um, assays on them. And prior to the 20 part per million glute, gluten rule, about 5% were labeled gluten free, but really were contaminated with gluten. So that'll probably get lower here now that the law passes. The one confusing thing I think with the gluten free labeling is it they're allowing naturally occurring gluten free foods to bear the gluten free label. So you'll see gluten free on a bottle of water or you'll see gluten free on a package of eggs. Well, yeah. So, I mean, it just kind of adds to the confusion because why would water need to be labeled gluten free in the first place? Um, we're going to talk just briefly about kind of the therapies that are going on right now with food allergies. Um, we have oral immunotherapy. Um, those are <coughs> broken down into oral immunotherapy and sublingual immunotherapy. Oral immunotherapy is feeding studies, basically. They start with extremely low amounts of the offending food, and they build their tolerance, and hopefully they make a switch in their immune system so that they can tolerate that allergic food. So it doesn't necessarily say, it's not necessarily a cure, but it boosts up their threshold enough so that if they got into trouble, say if they took a bite of something that was highly contaminated, they would not have a reaction at that level. It would boost their threshold up enough that anything below that would be safe. Um, sublingual immunotherapy is the same principle, except it is drops of the food protein. They stick it under their tongue and let it be absorbed for a minute and then they swallow. Um, they, it's at, the oral immunotherapy is milligrams of offending food, um, sublingual is micrograms. So it's two therapies that are showing promise, but they're kind of a little bit different. Um, there are some studies going on right now with the Chinese herbal therapy. Um, some Chinese researchers at Jaffe School of Food Allergy in New York um, came up with, it was like a 20 herb preparation, and now they've gotten it down to about seven or eight. They've done studies in rats and mice, and now they've moved to human trials. Um, baked eggs and baked milk. Some milk and some egg allergic people can tolerate milk and egg in a baked form. So they think that this is an indicator of people that will eventually outgrow it. And so my son Sam is one of these kiddos. Um, I start, like I've been going to the allergy conferences for a number of years, so I've been hearing baked egg, baked milk, and I thought, well, I'm just going to try it. Being the, the MD that I'm not, but <laughs> I thought, I'm just going to try some. So we started with Ego Waffle. He would take a bite, and he's really not interested in it, but he didn't get sick. So I was like, well, that's, that's progress. So we kind of continued. We'd do maybe a bite of cookie or I'd let him lick the frosting off the cupcake or take a little bite and we kind of just hung on for that. And so then when school started this year, he's five, he's just started kindergarten. Well, I got the packet in the mail from LPS and it was like this thick. I was like, oh dear God, do I really want to fill all these papers out? So I decided now was the time. He was first diagnosed when he was 16 months old. And so we've been doing egg avoidance for four years. So I thought, well, I think we're going to take him in to the doctor and get him tested. But before I could get him into the doctor, because it was like a four-month wait, I went to the allergy conference in March. And so I asked the, the dietitian from New York at Mount Sinai, I said, well, what do you do if they can tolerate the baked egg? If they can tolerate a waffle, what, what happens next? And she's like, well, then we challenge them to egg noodles. And I'm like, oh, okay. So when I got home from... <laughs> 
my allergy conference, I made goulash with Reem's frozen egg noodles. And he ate a whopping giant bowl of it. And he threw up all night and had diarrhea for the next two days. And I was like, oh, okay, we're not there yet. So finally in September, I got him in. They did a blood test, and it was negative for egg on his IgE. So the doctor, we challenged him with scrambled eggs, and the nurse was so poor that she made him eat cold scrambled eggs. I was assured that they were going to microwave them on each dose, and they did not. But they start with a teeny, like, half a fingernail amount, and every 15 minutes they increased his dose. They brought him in. We brought a big jug of water. He chugged it down. He hated every bite, but he made it, and he did not get sick. So we are free and clear to enjoy cupcakes at birthday parties now. But he still just licks the frosting. has no interest. So our take-home message is to completely avoid the allergen at this time. Hopefully, we'll see some regulations that perhaps will allow a little bit of contamination in food products. Um, always have an emergency action plan because accidents are never planned. You never know when something could cause some problems. Um, training and education is probably your biggest weapon in battling food allergies. And it's promising because there are a lot of different therapies on the horizon. So this is my attempt at humor. <laughs> and then here are some references. Um, the NIAID guidelines, they have both a copy for medical professionals and they also have one for consumers. It gives a very good background of what a food allergy is, kind of how to treat. Um, there is school board, the National School Board has guidelines on food allergies in the schools. Um, FAIR used to be called FAN, and now it's FAIR, and they have a lot of consumer, it's more of a consumer-driven website. Um, Allergic Living is a magazine, and then there is our website. We deal mostly with the food industry, but we answer consumer questions too. And that's it. I'm only about a minute over, right? Yeah.